Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show, Councillor Damien Kowalowicz. And I pronounced his name wrong. I already see the smile on his face of the town of U Royal in the province of British Columbia. Councillor, welcome to the show. <laughs> Chris, great to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, big fan of your work. And uh, we we all appreciate you getting the um, getting the voice out there for all the communities across Canada. Well, I appreciate that. But Damien, I'm going to call you Damien for this first segment, if you don't Absolutely. mind. Uh, during, uh, if so, if you've listened to the show, you know my first question. And you're no exception to that first question. So for you, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Damien? Yeah, and I think it's a very uh, important question for any anybody involved in public service to really ask yourself, why are you getting into it? For me, uh, I could tell you from a young age, I uh, grew up with my father and mother, both of them uh, government employees. My father uh, worked for the RCMP and we we grew up all over um, Northwest Territories, uh, Northern British Columbia. We lived on indigenous uh, land and reserves uh, growing up and uh, he was always active in the community. My mother uh, was a teacher her whole life and we, they were always both so active in the community and serving in one way or another, whether it was volunteering or, or, or serving the community through their employment. And it was just uh, a way of life. And I would tag along, my sister and I would tag along, whether it was, you know, volunteering for, for the Rotary Club or volunteering in the RCMP or doing something to do with teaching. It just, you just kind of do it. And I think a lot of people in life, you know, the, they look at what their parents did and if they're proud of them, they they follow in that footstep. But I will tell you one quick, tiny little anecdote here about kind of my, uh, my big jump into politics. And I can tell you when my father was, uh, he was a senior official in the RCMP. We were living in a community, Quinnell, you know, where Quinnell is. Uh, and we were there and there was a federal election happening and the uh, federal Lib liberal party, they asked my dad to run as their candidate. And um, of course, you know, and you've, Chris, you've spoken to so many politicians and, and, and I hate try, try not to use the uh, a pun here, but there's always a cross road um, when it comes to making decisions. So uh, if you know anything about federal employees, you can't, you can't be a federal politician and work for the federal government. So he had to make a decision. He decided to stay with the RCMP, great career, young family, you know, and I'll talk a bit about that later with me, with some of my aspirations but long story short he decided to stay with the mounties and he doesn't necessarily you know he talks about it in a way like you know don't pass up opportunities in life and you know there's really not a wrong decision there he stayed with the mounties did great you know great career and provided us a beautiful life but when it came time for me to because i'm a police officer right now too right full-time police officer with with the local police department here in greater victoria so I'm allowed to be a politician uh, on the side as long as it's not for my municipality. But when it came time for me to make that decision in 2017, I, I went to him and he just said, hey, just do it. <laughs> and he says one thing in life, you don't want regrets. You don't want to you don't want to miss opportunities. And um, and I guess that's that's kind of how it all happened. It just it just happened uh, organically, so to speak. And before before I knew it, it was unfolding before my very eyes. So you, you talked about your dad's entrance into federal politics, but you entered municipally. You entered into the municipal realm. Was municipal politics discussed at the dinner table or was it that federal because your dad was so close to the federal government being a Mountie, federal politics and even provincial politics may have been discussed? Was municipal talked about? Like, where does the desire to get involved municipally come from? We always would have discussions about 
about government, about politics, about different levels of government in Canada throughout my childhood, for sure. Uh, very um, aware uh, family when it came to uh, politics. For me, Chris, it came down to the decision of, okay, I am, you know, in my mid thirties when I first got elected, uh, as you know, if you join, uh, if, if you're so fortunate enough to get elected uh, provincially or federally, it means you're elected once and maybe not again. And for me, it came down to um, being unselfish with, with me and my responsibilities. I have, I have a family, I have two kids that are, that are young and I have a very, very stable career right now that I'm very proud of and making a jump into federal or provincial would have caused uncertainty for my family, to be honest with you. And I've had lots of discussions with different levels of government and opportunities have come my way, but ultimately right now, municipal politics is a very comfortable uh, zone that I'm in uh, to provide me with my my toe in the water and also um, be able to provide, you know, a, a life for my family that, you know, everyone can can uh, do their sports and live their life and, and not worry about um, the paychecks coming in um, in five years from now. So in 2017, 2018, you're first elected. 2017, I'm assuming that the discussions are being held that should I enter into politics? And now correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm just going by what the Civic Info BC election results showed me. But in 2018, you were first elected, correct? 2017, I won a by-election. Oh, see, I see. This is why I like not doing a lot of research because then I could. <laughs> then I'm like, oh, I totally knew that. I just wanted to yeah, see if yeah. you remember. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So, so 2017, you run in a by election. What happens in 2017 that you say, okay, if not now, when? If not, if not this election, what election? What was the, the what was the issue for you that you said, nope, Damien's getting involved now. It was uh, a moment in my life where, and I think a lot of us have had these, where an opportunity arises and um, you're not necessarily like waiting for it to happen. It, it kind of comes up out of the blue and you go, you're trying to find a way to tuck yourself out of it or into it. And eventually uh, my wife and I made the decision, okay, let's do this. Um, was it a, a family decision? Was it Absolutely. a family decision? Okay. hundred percent, hundred percent. It it has to be. And and Chris, you know this, talking to all the candidates and uh, elected officials across Canada, you can say that it's a, a part-time thing, but it's just, it's a huge commitment. And the way that you, uh, you know, there's discussions that happen, like what, what's it going to look like for your family and the community? You're, you're, you're treated differently. Your, your kids are treated differently. You're, you know, your spouses, you, you know, um, that moment of, uh, you know, you pushing your trash out to the curb, you know, of, of being just, you know, anybody becomes a lot different and people, everybody knows who you are and they, they're watching and it's, it's a big decision. So in 2017, what was the issue? Because there was, there must've been an issue that you said, okay, I believe I'm going to be the one that can best address this issue, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be with your background in the police force, uh, being safety. What was the issue that ultimately decided, okay, we need to address this in the town of View Royal? I would say one of the biggest reasons why I ran is, and we still have this right now, is that our council it was in need of some diversity in a sense that, and I realize I'm a, I'm a middle-aged Caucasian male, but actually um, the, the council of the day then of course were Caucasian males, but all um, older adults and had been elected for decades and decades. And I knew that uh, we needed an influx of, of a, of a younger candidate. Our, our view Royal community has changed drastically over the past decade we're up to 11, 12,000 people on the last census, and it's become a real family haven. And with with a young family, I knew that I could I could tick that box for a lot of voters and authentically speak on their behalf. So that was probably my main reason, Chris, to be honest with you, is just representation. I like a politician who's honest, so I appreciate your yeah. honesty, Damien. Yeah. Um, you seem to let, you have a pulse on the community. You get elected the, in a by-election. You get elected in the uh, subsequent two elections after that. 
Were there issues at the doorstep in that first by-election that you were shocked to hear about when you were talking to people and you went, I didn't know that this was an issue? Because as much as people say they have a pulse on the community, there's always those micro, micro issues that come up that you just aren't prepared for, but you're happy to address. Well, I learned very quickly, Chris, that every neighborhood has has a thing and <laughs> that and, and that still rings very true for probably every neighborhood across Canada and one uh one issue in particular I can recall during the 27 by-election and it served me well obviously being a peace officer is that they were uh, discussing the opening of it's it's a cutting edge uh, therapeutic recovery center based on a model from Italy Okay. And it's it's still open and it's called New Roads. And basically it's an alternative to um, to the correctional facilities in Canada. And this, um, what happened in View Royal, we used to house a youth detention center. So the infrastructure was there. And there there was a movement to to move it into a adult therapeutic recovery center. So there's still you know fences and it it's still you're 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 not allowed to leave. And it's in the middle of it's it's near it's near a highway, but it's, it's near residences. And it was it was kind of a hot button issue at the time, and that was really kind of my springboard for being able to speak to the public safety issue of that and what that would look like. So that uh, I was comfortable with that. I want to take you back to by election night now. By election night is always a well, the by election day is always a fun day because, and if you've listened to the show, you know the question I'm about to ask because I, I had the pleasure to vote for myself not once but twice. And it, it's a surreal experience seeing your name on that ballot and putting an X or a check mark beside your name. For you, what was that experience like? And did you ever think to yourself going into that ballot box, what have I done? Why am I, po- what, what have I gotten myself into? What if I do win and I have to start making decisions? It's anybody who says that there's not some anxiety or regret or excitement, you know, they're not telling the truth because it's a big deal, Chris. And I take it very seriously. I can tell you, I didn't know if I was going to be successful or not. Really? (laughs) You're funny. I mean, no, 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 honestly, because every politician I speak to, and I know I'm taking up time from you, but everyone I talk to says, oh, no, I wasn't, I didn't expect to win. I'm like, well, why'd you put your name forward then? You kind of run to win. You don't, you don't run to lose. (laughs) No, and I I agree. I I ran to win and I, I worked my butt off. I can tell you that, but you never know until, until game day. And I can tell you this last municipal election here in Vancouver Island was a reality check. I think we lost like 90% 90% of our mayors here in, in greater Victoria. So anything can happen. And I just, I didn't know what happened. I was with my family and uh, you know, you just, it's, it's funny because people start to find out before you even know, and, and then you start getting the the happy texts and then, you know, things are, things have gone well. And in a by-election, you gotta be, you gotta be the top dog. That's it. You, you, you can't come in second or third. And there were seven of us, I think for one spot. So I was, you know, I I was very, very, you know, very excited to win, obviously. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but the town of View Royal does not does not have political parties like Vancouver or Surrey, right? They're all independents like most Correct. of Canada. Okay. Correct. Yeah. I just wanted to double check that. Yeah. Um, so election night comes, you get the blue check mark beside your name. You're officially the councillor elect for the town of View Royal. What goes through your head? Do you, is there an excitement that, that turns into now the responsibility of actually governing my town starts? Yeah, just the unknown, Chris, because you can prepare as much as you want for anything in life, but until your your butt's in the seat, so to speak, you just really don't know what it looks like behind the curtain. And you know, you go to your first council meeting and you get sworn in, and there's this buzz, and everybody's happy because you've haven't made a decision that's impacted them negatively. So everyone likes you still. And, and then, you know, you start going through the motions at the council table and you figure out who's who and, and the politics of politics and, and the relationships that are either strong or need improvement at the council table. And, you know, you go through these first couple of meetings, Chris, and, and you vote on something and you go, wait a second, like, how did that 
happen. And, and little do you know, there's, you know, there's things happening behind the, the curtain that you're not in on yet. And so that takes a while to, to learn. And some of the counselors that, that I was uh, sitting with, and some of them are still there, but I mean, they've been there for 20 plus years, Chris. So, you know, good luck trying to, trying to keep up with uh, the insider uh, scoop there. So you, you were elected in 2017 in a by-election, elected, re-elected in 2018 to a full term. 2022, you were just recently re-elected. Yeah. You, you have, I'm going to say this, but I'm going to, I'm not trying to burst your bubble, but you, you can be classified as a politician now. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who were just elected in the last municipal elections in BC, because like you said, there was a big changeover. What advice would you give these new term counselors? Because you had the opportunity to go in halfway through a term for somebody and take their spot. What advice would you give them? Is it education? Is it being prepared? What what advice would you give to your fellow counselors who are looking for advice? So this is going to probably cross over into some of your future questions down the road here, but that's fine. Um, stick to your values and we'll get into this later maybe if you want to but you're going to get pulled in a million different directions and you will be you will be um you have these groups advocating on on this you know on a small area small neighborhood small issue and you'll they'll they'll just be all over you about about something and you won't hear anything um, in the opposite, oh, yeah. you'll just hear, you'll hear this one, you know, one story and it's very easy to go. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Right. And, and I was guilty of that a couple of times, but it, you need to stick to your values and, and you need to think on behalf of, of all the residents, all your constituents, even if it's an unpopular decision, which is very challenging to make, especially when you're in council chambers and you've got, you know, 25 people from this one neighborhood who says, you know, don't build X, Y, Z in my neighborhood. And nobody except them is, is opposing it, but nobody's really supporting it. So, you know, it's, it's challenging. It's very challenging, Chris. And so just stick to your values and, you can't go wrong with that. Although, so how do you hard. do that? How do you do that? And I, I, I know we were going to talk about this a little bit later, but this is just a fascinating conversation already. How do you stick to your values in such a hyperbolic, hyperpartisan Twitter verse mm-hmm. social media feed of everyone wants to be uh, liked, but you have to make the tough decision. So, how do you stick to your values? when you have so many conflicting people yelling at you and the vocal minority is the one that is only heard you know that that's a great query and <laughs> my my advice would be first of all you have to you have to be prepared you have to be prepared so if you're going to say yes or no to something you have to you have to do your research you have to read the staff reports and yes they could be hundreds of pages you have to get boots on the ground if needed you have to look at things from not only 35,000 feet above, but if there's two groups maybe opposing each other, you have to do your best and, and see what, what their vantage point looks like. When it comes time for game day, what I would tell a, a politician is of any stripes, of, of any rank of federal, provincial, municipals, your decision that you're making, and you have a chance to talk typically during during the that during the motions and discussion. Have something to say that's fact based and it can tie into your values. That's fine. But if you're going to decide something, have a reason and and articulate yourself, be confident um, and, and state the facts. I, I really hesitate to give politicians advice to give their you know opinion on things. And we see we see personal opinion really creep in a lot. And I think it's natural in life. But you know, remaining objective really is is the best piece of advice I can give a politician. And there has to be that balance, the authenticity of being a human, because you're you're gonna, you know, you're gonna disappoint some people with your decision. Um, but it, you just have to articulate yourself in an authentic manner with some evidence or fact based, um, you know, comments that are gonna support your decision. And I think most Canadians 
you know, you, they look at these decisions that politicians make. I mean, I look at them all the time and, and you go, okay, yeah, I, I get it. Like, I don't agree with that, but I, I can see their point. And I think most Canadians hopefully are reasonable that way and can at least go, yeah, I don't like it, but I get it. We're going to talk a little bit more about some issues uh, later on, but I want to end this segment with this question. You've been elected for almost six years now, seven, if I'm doing my math here, correct, six years. Um, Have you found the balance? Have you found the personal and private life balance? Because I can imagine you're not going off to Victoria. You're not going off to Ottawa to do your job. You're elected to represent your community in your community. So if you go to the grocery stores, you're a counselor. If you go out to a park with your family, you're the counselor. Is there days where you just want to be Damien? You know, I would say for me, Chris, I've had a lot of years to prepare for this because being a police officer, you you have we have a certain set of standards here in British Columbia. It's called the British Columbia Police Act. You may have heard of it. And we're governed now. They changed it a couple of years ago. So even off duty, we have um, rules that we need to abide by. So it's, it's kind of old hat for me and I, I, that I'm not dismissing the question at all, but I would say it ha- hasn't had a huge change for me. I mean, I'm, I'm on the television a lot with, with the police department as one of the public spokesperson uh, there. And I'm very comfortable with that. And um, I'm always mindful that, you know, someone could be watching you and making making sure you know for example i'll tell you i'll tell you something this morning this is what happened so i'm one of my um political appointments i'm the chairperson of the west shore parks and rec society it's a you know massive rec center that have that we we have you know six communities we serve anyways so there i am this morning walking my dog and there's a big sign and i love my dog loves going off leash there's a big sign there chris it says what does it say Dogs no off on a leash <laughs> yeah so what do i do i keep Keep them on a leash, even though most people don't. Um, I have to, so I do. So there's just there's just a small example. I hope hope that makes sense. Oh, it does. It does. So someone who worked in municipal uh, the municipal realm up in northern Alberta, I can tell you, politicians are always aware of what they're doing and what they're they should and shouldn't be doing because on Facebook, the moment a counselor does something wrong, well, he does it. So why can't I? <laughs> You got it. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Now I want to turn to segment two and segment two, because I am cautious of time here. Okay. I want to preface this, this statement, uh, this question by saying this, this is an opinion by the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is his opinion. We always get a lot of feedback on this question. I do not know why, but it seems to be one of the most controversial questions I ask. So counselor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the town of view Royal as of recording? So as you know, British Columbia, we very well recently, five months ago, had an election uh, just at the end of 2022. So mm-hmm. we had um, we had a mayor that uh, that changed and we have a new mayor. And our, our last mayor, David, he served as a councillor and a mayor for a few decades. And so now we have a brand new mayor. And it's no secret that the election issue was the official community plan. And that is something we're working through right now as a council is deciding on, on what that's going to look like. Uh, the, the, the plan was we had a draft official community plan that was in place prior to the election. We put it on pause and we were going to pick it up again after the election. But since it became an election election issue, which is not a secret. I don't mind talking about it because it's out there. We talk about it in meetings all the time, open meetings. Now, now we're revisiting what the public engagement is going to look like, what the plan itself is going to look like, how much we're going to spend on it. As you know, official, official community plans are a big deal and they are the roadmap to any any town or city. Uh, so that by far right now is is our uh, is our baby. So you have been with the town I'm assuming since the first conception of the redraft of the official community plan, you're now redoing it again. What's going to change? What do you see is going to look differently compared to what was, do you think the election is going to affect the final result compared to what the draft official community plan was when you first got it? 
I do. I know it will. I know that How so? there I know that there are <laughs> various neighborhoods that have been vocal about their displeasure for potential What are they change. displeased about? And I'm going to put a pressure on that for a second. <laughs> sure. Is, is it housing? Sure. Yeah. Is it the nimbyism yeah. about the whole because that is the big issue that I think a lot of people don't understand is people want to grow in that debate that I heard you, uh, you with the Chamber of Commerce that you did via Zoom, I heard about the how you guys need to grow and all that. But is growth a big issue in the town? We have been growing exponentially in View Royal for for a while. Our latest census saw a couple thousand people increase. We're on schedule to continue to grow. We have some major developments right now. We're strategically placed in the middle of the Capital Regional District in Greater Victoria. We have a very desirable uh, location for real estate and new development. Uh, we have aging uh, residential neighborhoods that are ripe for turning into higher density housing on uh, major uh, infrastructure, highway areas and, and, and pedestrian and cycling areas. Right now, we we have pushback from certain neighborhoods about density increasing near them. Yes, Chris, you're absolutely right. And you've heard it a million times before. <laughs> and you'll hear it a million times more. Shockingly, nimbyism is a big thing in municipalities. I, I would never have guessed that when I started this show. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you deal with that, though? Because you're as an elected official have to be there to represent the whole community. You can't just look at one section of the town or one section of a city, one section of a village. You have to look at it as a whole and you have to move the town forward as one, not this neighborhood and that neighborhood. How do you do that when people may push back? It's very challenging. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, it really is. There's no right answer to that question. And how do you, you see your how do you see your role as helping alleviate some of that? Well, you have to listen to to your current residents. You, you, there's no way of getting around that. And I think if if they've lived in a neighborhood for you know 20, 30, 40 years, and all of a sudden you want to build a townhouse complex that borders their single family dwellings, that's a big deal for them. And you know, I think. Canada's demographics, <laughs> there's there's a shift in in thinking. I, I think I think some of our generations are more comfortable with change, and some are more comfortable with keeping things the way they always have been. And well, that's, how, how how did yeah. municipalities grow in that situation? Because you're right, and the town of View Royal is no exception to this. And I know we're supposed to be talking about issues. It's just Damien, I find you a fascinating guy and I feel like we could chat for like three hours just on this issue alone. Yeah, but I want to know in in just in, in, in a, I know I'm going to ask you to give me the elevator pitch, but how do you move a town forward when you have people who don't want to see it move forward as a council? <clears throat> you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And what, what I mean by that is you're going to have to make decisions that will cause people to um, not support you in the future, maybe. But again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. You have to be able to articulate yourself and say, listen, we're not here to try to make your lives, you know, you know, bad. This these decisions we're making are for are for future generations. And we're looking at things from a global perspective. We're receiving input from professionals. We're densifying on major corridors. We're doing everything that experts are telling us to do to grow our communities thoughtfully and, and safely and, and to be able to move people around with the most ease. And we'll do it with as much of a minimal impact as we can for your single family dwelling. And a matter of fact, we'll tell these new developers that they have to build sidewalks. They have to build a park, you know, whatever you want, we'll, we'll make them do it um, as, as a peace offering. I want to turn to the residents now because you, you, you talked about what you believe is in your opinion is the biggest issue facing your community. But if I go talk to a hundred people in the, the town, 
they may make they may give me that issue as well. They may say the official community plan is my big issue, but they might also talk to me about some micro issues, potholes, parks, uh, street lamps, so on and so forth. Now, you as councillor have to take all the all the issues that people bring to you and present them to council and look at them and try to figure out how to move the town forward without leaving anyone behind. So, how do you do that? Because I can imagine. At budget time, you have to look at what you've heard and try to dissect who's going to win by getting what they want and who's going to lose and maybe not get it till next year. This year, <clears throat> municipalities across Canada are facing budget increases. You will know the economy has changed drastically in the last 12 months. Uh, View Royal alone, and I'm not speaking out of turn, we're looking at a 9% tax increase oh. for, our, for our community. And the costs of policing and fire and everything has has risen uh, drastically over the past year. I think I think our community. I mean, and we, if you look at the census, we we actually have quite a uh, affluent community here. We're obviously in Greater Victoria, so it's it's not exactly known as a cheap place to live. <laughs> I think if you asked a hundred view royal residents what their issue was, you, you'd get a lot of different answers. Uh, are you happy with that? Are you happy that people actually are willing to talk about their issues? I think in, in general, like we just did a we just did a, um, a pretty large community engagement survey just prior to the last election, and we got a lot of we got a lot of different answers. And it's it's good and bad, Chris, because you can't solve you can't <laughs> take everything on. Um, housing was was one of the biggest issues. And I mean, yes, that was a year and a half ago, but people literally are wanting more housing, like in general, right? Like, so- They just don't want it in their backyard. <laughs> Jokingly, I'm sorry. I have to- You, you know what? Mind. It's, it's I, I am very comfortable saying that there are a lot of people who who want increased services and infrastructure and housing and, and A, B, C, D, E- but just not near them. I'm very comfortable saying that because that's very typical. That's not a secret. So don't worry about saying that. It's the truth. Yeah. Um, I want to pose this last question before we turn to the last segment, because I am cautious of uh, time here. Okay. Um, so we're talking in, we're, we're recording this in March. It goes out in April. If I came and talked to you at the end of this year and I said, Hey, Damien, remember that conversation we had, uh, I asked you the question that I asked a lot of people. What do you hope to accomplish as counselor by the end of this year? At the end of 2023, if I came to you and I said, what's the issue that you got done that you said you were going to get done in our recording? What would that issue be for you? Yeah. So for me personally, if you're following British Columbia at all, you've known uh, that the British Columbia NDP, who are currently the governing political party here in British Columbia just gave out billions of dollars to municipalities. I think we received four million. I think we did oh, wow. something like something like that. Like just the town in general got four. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it was four. It was four. I think every Alberta mayor is yelling at every BC community right now. <laughs> well, it's a whole other thing that we could talk yeah. about for now. Anyways, but. I guess if you ask me in a year, I would want to come back to you, Chris, and say, hey, we spent that money. It's called the Growing Communities Fund. Yeah. We spent that money on, you know, new uh, new sidewalks, new parks, recreation, um, something that the community turns around and says, hey, you folks made the right decision. That, that for me, I mean, this is a big deal. This is, this is probably... I don't think it's going to happen again. Like it's, it's pretty, pretty wild to be honest with you to receive a windfall like this. And there's the terms of reference are, we just got them and there's, you know, there's certain parameters, but there's lots of options. Right. And um, we have, like I said, the Western parks and rec, I serve as the chairperson there. So they didn't get any money as part of this growing communities fund. So like, for example, we need a new roof on the pool. It's a million, million dollars. Um, and so I just, I want to come back. I would want to come back to you and say, Hey, we did this. And the community said, good job. That's That would be my goal for that for the $4 million bucks. Good to hear. I want to turn to my last segment because this is my fun. This is the fun segment that I find fun because I like tourism. I like traveling and I like spending my economic dollars 
in Canada. Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I've said to people, if you come onto the show, I will be in your community. So there's a few uh, towns and villages on the island that I have to get to. One is Colwood, and the uh, View Royal is going to be right beside it. So it's going to be an easy one to hit. But I will be in your community spending my economic dollars. So as I have listeners from across Canada and around the world, where would you say are some of the tourist hotspots for the town you should be going to? Well, you brought it up, not me. So you said you wanted to spend money. And yeah, we have, I, we... <laughs> I, I love spending money. I'm an Albertan, of course. <laughs> so we have the largest casino on Vancouver Island in View Royal. Really? It's called Elements Casino. And it's... Uh, it sits uh, in our in our town, and there's a cost sharing or a profit sharing agreement with the uh, with municipalities here in the West Shore. But it's it's our baby, and uh, there is they just they just built a brand new theater there. You know they got a buffet and, and put live poker and you you name it. It's huge, huge. There's talks of building a hotel on uh, on site there. So that, of course, uh, please, Chris, be responsible when you're there. But uh, uh, I'll bring in twenty dollars. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, and then after that, we have uh, well, we're, we obviously we have the ocean here in View Royal, but we also um, and I'll I'll start with that. So we have we have a park called Portage Park. It's it's a little. And I was just on another podcast about a month ago, and I I dropped Portage Park. So I'll tell you too. It's a beautiful park with with a beach and some walking trails and, and a washroom and playgrounds and it is it is stunning. It is absolutely stunning. You walk down to the beach and you can see uh, the the Olympic Mountains and and you can see Washington State and it's just that's paradise. So spend some time there. And then the other the other place is you know, obviously know we're part of the Capital Regional District here and there's a lake in View Royal. Um, called Thetis Lake and there's several lakes there but it, it is um, it's paradise there's no uh, motorboats allowed there's probably 10 15 trails uh, kilometers of trails uh, you know paddle paddle boards and and uh, swimming and jumping off rocks safely into the water that are close to shore and swimming and washrooms and, and picnic tables and uh, it, it is. I mean, you should see this place, Chris, in the summer. It looks like I will see it this summer. It is pandemonium. <laughs> there are thousands. Maybe of in there. the autumn. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, and there'll be people selling food and just it's cool. It's really cool. And uh, there's a paddleboard shop right down the road. So you can rent the paddleboard. You pull it up on the wheels there, you know, like the little uh you can portage it up on wheels and you can paddleboard for a couple hours. It's, it's really cool. Very cool. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. But what about yourself? Where do you go in the town to just decompress after a stressful day at work or a stressful day at yeah. council? Where, where's the, is there a local watering hole? Is there a spot that you can just go a park walking trail that you just get away and just reconnect with yourself? We have two of the oldest pubs on Vancouver Island, the four mile and the six mile pub. And they are they are very famous here locally. They've been around for a I don't know the dates, but and we don't have a we don't have a, a heritage or historic bylaw yet. I think we're going to look into one. Anyways, they would definitely fit that parameter. I mean, these are these are old. They've been they the original. Like people used to go there on horse and buggy, and so those are pretty cool. And we have a lot of parks in View Royal, a lot of walking trails. And yeah, you can find me uh, usually just either walking, walking my dog or just relaxing, spending time with my family and just trying to just trying to chill out and uh, turn my brain off for 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask you the million dollar question now, counselor, and this is the one that you can take as long as you want to answer or as short as time that you want to answer. In your opinion, what makes the town of View Royal such a unique place to live? to work, and to raise a family. Well, if you choose to live in Greater Victoria, Chris, we are the, I call View Royal the center of the universe, jokingly, but we're the center of, we're the center of the CRD. So if you look at a map of the CRD, you've got, you know, you got Colwood and Langford, Victoria, Saanich, all these places, we are right in the middle. So you can get anywhere quick, which is really nice. And that's, I think a lot, a lot of residents, that's their favorite thing is just the location. 
we have a very safe community generally. We don't have uh, a ton of commercial. We uh, call it a detriment, call it a good thing. We don't we don't have a town center where, you know, there's, you know, either negative or, or whatever things happening all the time. So it's kind of a lot of community no neighborhood nodes. So it's very community oriented that way, which which I kind of like. It's you know, and I know there's been discussions of a town center for us a long time, but we have a lot of community nodes, and you really get to be comfortable in these in these smaller neighborhoods. It's um, we have good schools. We have really good schools for for our younger kids. Lots of parks, and I think generally, like our 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 resident satisfaction survey, Chris, we had a really high return rate on just people being satisfied living here, and th that's a good thing. So, um, yeah, I I would I would definitely recommend uh, anybody um, would would probably feel comfortable here in View Royal, uh, no matter if you're by yourself or the family or or whatever. Yeah. Counselor, I want to thank you so much for sitting down, taking 45 minutes out of your day today and just doing this. It's always great to sit down and learn from municipal elected leaders about their communities and about why they chose to get into municipal politics. So thank you so much for doing this today. Thanks, Chris. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five to 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and dear God, it helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We'll be back tomorrow for our 550th episode with Halton Hills Regional Councillor Clark Somerville. Until then, chat later. Mm -hmm.